the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the Gospel of St. Luke, when the Archangel Gabriel appeared to our Blessed Mother, he said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. And therefore also the Holy which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Here in this announcement to Our Lady, there are three things happening that show the power of God acting on Mary. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. This is a clear reference to the third person of the Blessed Trinity. The second is the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee, referring to God the Father, the first person of the Blessed Trinity. And the Holy which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God, meaning our Blessed Lord, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Now, each divine person of the Blessed Trinity is acting as a unified principle through Mary in order to fulfill God's promise of sending His Son into the world. Now, what do we mean when we say the Blessed Trinity? In the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity, there are two basic truths. The first is that there is only one God. The second, that in God, there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But in this, we need to realize that the Trinity is a supernatural mystery, and we can't understand it with our limited human mind. We can't come to it by reason, and we can't completely understand it, even after it has been revealed by God. When we say one God, we're talking about the essence of God, what He is. His nature. Nature tells us what something is. God in His divine nature is eternal. He always was and He always will be. In other words, there was no time where God did not exist. God revealed to the prophet Isaiah, He said, I am the first and I am the last, and besides me, there is no God. There is only one God, and there is nothing greater than God. This is his divine nature. This is what God is. Tertullian tells us, that which is the highest greatness must be unique and have no equal in order not to cease to be the highest. God is the highest good. If God is not one, then there is no God. What he is saying here is that that which is highest has to be unique. There's nothing else like it and it can have no equal to it. It has to stand alone. It has to be one. And since God is the highest and the greatest good, and He can have an equal, there is only one God. This is the essence and the nature of what God is, to be one. So what do we mean when we say person? Well, first we need to define what person is. According to St. Thomas, He says that person is an individual substance of rational nature. Now, what is he saying by all that? What he is saying is that a person is a being that is intelligent and responsible for his own actions. A person always tells us who someone is. Each divine person in the Blessed Trinity is God. That's the nature of God. The Father is God. The Son is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. Yet we do not say that there are three gods. There are three persons in one God. Since each person is God, they are all eternal. Which means that there is no time in which any of these divine persons did not exist. To know that there are three divine persons, this has to be revealed to us by God. This is not something that we can know through human nature alone. So I'll do a quick review right now on the person and nature of the Trinity by looking at Christ becoming man. Now we know person always answers the question, who? Who was born of Mary? God the Father? No. God the Holy Spirit? No. God the Son, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, is who became man and who was born of Mary. Now all three are God. That is their nature. 
That is what they are. But only one of these divine persons became man. Who refers to the person and what they are refers to the nature. Now with this explanation, we want to look at the mystery of the relationship of each and every one of the persons with each other and how they came to be in the Blessed Trinity. To begin, to begin this, we need to realize that God is a pure spirit. Now, a spirit can act in two ways. The first is that the spirit acts with the intellect, that is, the ability to know and to understand. The second is that the spirit acts through the will. A spirit can act to do something. The ability is in doing something. That is part of the will. Now, in Genesis, we read that when God created man, he created man like himself, and he said, let, let us make man in our image, meaning with an intellect and a will. God doesn't act according to the passions, so he doesn't have passions, but he is a spirit, and so he has intellect and a will. And this is what is part of God. St. Augustine tells us that the memory, the intellect, and the will are the faculties forming the image of God in us. And this is what God is telling us in Genesis. Now, we mentioned that the first act of the Spirit is the work of the intellect, the work of the mind, the ability to know and to understand. Now, God is eternal, and when He is acting as a Spirit, because He existed before anything was ever made, God knows Himself from eternity. This knowledge of Himself is His own divine image. This knowledge of Himself is an infinite thought of an infinite being, namely of himself. So when God is alone, who does he think of? He thinks of himself. Now this isn't vain because he's God. So God the Father, in thinking of himself and knowing himself perfectly as God, produces an image of himself so perfectly and so infinitely that his thought begets, it doesn't create, but begets a second person. This second person is the Son and we call him this because he is begotten of the Father. Because God is infinite in himself, and the object of his thought, meaning himself, is infinite too, then the second person, too, is God. This is the divine person that became man and was born of Mary. Now, if we don't entirely understand it, it's okay. It's a mystery, and we won't understand it fully. But God reveals a little bit to us so that we can understand God's nature and God's being. For God, there is no time. Eternity is outside of time. So it's not like there was a time when the Father was alone and the second person did not exist. We're talking about eternity. For God, it's all instantaneous. It just is for all eternity. From the beginning, all three persons existed. But for us, it's difficult to comprehend because we exist in time and we understand only in terms of time, before and after. But for our understanding, we need to explain it in this sequence. This is one of those things that makes this mystery what it is. Now, what about the Holy Ghost? Where does he come from? The Nicene Creed tells us that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, what does that mean? The Son, as God, possesses all that the Father has, except fatherhood. Since the Son comes from the Father or we properly say is begotten of the Father, he's only a son, so he doesn't share in fatherhood. But the son shares in everything else, including infinity. But he is not the same person as the Father. He's a different person. The son, because he's a different person, is then able to love the Father through an infinite act of the will. It is an infinite act of the will because he is God, and his action is infinite. Now, both persons, the God, God the Father, excuse me, and God the Son, love each other infinitely. Now, this infinite act of the will is the love between the Father and the Son. Remember, love is an act of the will. Now, this act of love between the Father and the Son is infinite. And this infinite act produces a third person. And this third person we call the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Now, again, we can't fully understand this mystery, but God has given the doctors and the fathers of the church great wisdom so that they can at least give us this understanding. 
Now this action of the Trinity is happening in the souls that are in the state of sanctifying grace. This is the divine indwelling. Now I'll just get into this briefly because this is a whole sermon in and of itself. The divine indwelling. But it is perfectly true that God lives in us when we are in the state of sanctifying grace. St. Thomas tells us that sanctifying grace is a supernatural quality inherent in the soul which makes us partakers of divine nature and divine life. So this blessed trinity is in our souls when we're in the state of sanctifying grace. This divine life is what we need to get to heaven. But mortal sin destroys this life of grace in our souls and causes us to lose that indwelling of the blessed trinity in our souls. The life of the blessed trinity living in our souls, is God himself. Now it is totally and completely above our nature. Because God is living in our souls, we have the power, even at our puny human level, to do what God can do by nature. God wants us to be raised up to be like God so that we can truly be called sons and daughters of God. God wants us to reflect the image of his Son, St. Paul calls Christ the image of the invisible God and the figure of the substance of God. We know that God the Father loves His Son infinitely. And when God the Father sees us conformed to His Son and imitating Him, He sees the image of Himself. And this is most pleasing to God because He loves His Son infinitely. The imitation of Christ tells us Let it then be our chief study to meditate upon the life of Christ. But he who would fully and feelingly understand the words of Christ must make his whole life conformable to that of Christ. So just like each divine person of the Blessed Trinity acted as a unified principle to bring Christ into the world, so also is each divine person of the Blessed Trinity acting in our souls as a unified principle in order to bring the life of Christ into our souls and help us to imitate Him perfectly. So let's review. There is one God who is eternal. He always was and He always will be. In God there are three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are not three gods, but three persons. And each person is an individual substance of a rational nature. Each is his own person, we can say, but they are all God. The Father, the first person, begets the Son by a perfect and infinite act of the intellect. This infinite knowledge of himself as God is an infinite act which begets, does not create, but begets the second person of the Son. The Son then loves the Father with an infinite act of the will, and the Father returns that infinite act of love. That infinite love between these infinite divine persons breathes forth a third divine person, and that is the Holy Ghost. Now this is all a mystery, and we can't fully understand it. But this is the Trinity, and it exists in reality, and the Trinity exists and lives in those souls who are living in sanctifying grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.